Leah, the founder of Broadstairs Consulting. We're a board advisory and mediation practice, helping people thrive and flourish in crisis situations. Believe in crisis isn't an if, it's a when. We want to help people disagree well and move forwards in challenging times. While we are unafraid of crisis, it's rare for one to be resolved in a single day. However long the day or night that gave rise to the crisis in the first place, there's always something we can learn. That's the genesis of the longest day. Our guests have overcome a litany of crises. Many have worked with us in some capacity in the past. All of them have stories worth hearing. We trust them to make this worth your while. We hope it helps you trust us. This week's guest on The Longest Day is Clemmie Telford. She's a mother of three and content creator behind the Mother of All Lists blog and the Honestly and But Why podcasts. She spent the first 13 years of her career as a creative director and copywriter in top ad agencies. Her foray into social media began as a form of therapy whilst on maternity leave. Since then, she has set about using her platforms to enable conversations about subjects that some might deem awkward or uncomfortable. Clemmie used to live in Peckham, southeast London, but I met her in Broadstairs, where she's been incredibly busy fixing up an incredible townhouse with her husband and kids. A woman after my own heart, she likes food, fitness and fashion, and ideally not staying up too late. Well, Clemmie, thank you so much for being willing to join us on The Longest Day. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Perhaps you might like to tell us about your longest day. This has been an interesting experience for me, actually, asking myself this question, because I think if you look back in your career, and I'm, I don't know, what, 20 years into it, there's highs and lows. But the one that came through, which is the one I'm going to speak about, actually, as I've as I've sat with it over the last couple of days, I realised it was more significant than I perhaps realised. So I was, I am again, but I was a creative director in advertising, had worked in the industry for, I don't know, eight to ten years when I had my first baby. In fact, I had two kids quite close together. My uh, my boys are two years apart, but I was very, very committed to my career, so I had short maternity leaves or short maternity leaves for this country anyway I think they were about seven or eight months and with each of them I went back and I was very vigilant about trying to fit a five-day week into four days doing many more hours than I should have done uh frequently missing bath and bedtime basically prioritizing work over my family and my big passion or the reason for doing that was because I, the, at the time, I think only 3% of creative directors were female. And I was absolutely driven to try and change that statistic because I thought it was a travesty for all the reasons in, in terms of female equality, but also in terms of the fact that a lot of the marketing we were doing was to women and to women over the age of 30. And yet those people writing the ads weren't for them. So that's all the context. I thought it was going well. I thought my career was progressing. I was managing to to get promotions, even though I'd had two kids. So I felt like I was being the, the statistic for change. And then I went out for a very significant meal with a couple of peers. And I think this is really an important bit. In all of my career, because I'm a female, I'd never openly discussed my salary. In fact, even with my good friends until the last couple of years, we hadn't discussed salary. But within that conversation during that night, it became apparent to me that I was being paid like 70% of what I should have been being paid for the role that I was doing. And I just remember just absolute clarity of, of so many feelings, actually. Anger, embarrassment... And just, I think it's that real sudden realisation in the culture and advertising at that time, you're made to feel like it was a family and there's a lot of blurred boundaries between work and life and there's a lot of fun. And then you just like, nobody cares about me as a person. They care about what I'm doing and how much value I can bring, but they're absolutely ripping me off. And worst of all, I've sacrificed very, very precious time with my my babies as a result. That's an awful thing to experience. What did you do with that information? So at, at first I, I definitely turned in on myself. Um, that that was definitely my instinct. Uh, and I, I think it was a, a, definitely a form of grief actually. 
And then, then you move on, and, and again, I guess it is kind of a grief, grief path. You move to a place of anger. I didn't know that this was part of the puzzle, but at the time I had started what was a side hustle. I'd started um, out on social media and that had grown. And I guess that side hustle was my way of, of giving me power in a job that wasn't that job. Um, I did go and ask for a pay rise, which I was either offered something very, very small in comparison. And I was just definitely made to feel like I was stupid for even having an issue. So I I left. I went to work in tech, which was much better paid. And actually during the negotiation for that role, for the first time ever, I went and spoke to headhunters. I actually understood what my pay grade should have been. And I, I negotiated hard. So that was a real moment for me. But what I didn't realise is I went to to work in tech for a year, then I had another child and then my side hustle became my main hustle. So essentially the consequence of, of it was that I left the industry and the thing that I'd been trying to fight to do um, and actually I've been quite trying to fight for it in quite a visible way. I'd been organising dinners for women in advertising. I'd been writing articles. It's like I, I felt like a bit of a fraud, I think. So, yeah. I left. One of the things that strikes me in your experience is that people weren't transparent with you to give you the information that you needed to be able to thrive. Who was encouraging you at this time to advocate for yourself, to be paid what you deserve, to be recognised for your skills? Who was supporting you? I don't think anybody was, other than the, the, the women I was, I was with on that dinner, actually. Um, who one of them was a woman called Ali Hans who's gone on to create a organisation called Creative Equals with exactly this mission in mind. I don't think anyone was, and and I look back and even in my junior roles, it was it was rare to be a, a female in my job. And when I started out, I was in a, in a all female team, and we were always known as the as the female team. And I just just wasn't part of the dialogue and. Then as I've got older and I've got more of a female network, now I understand how that boys club works. You know, we, of course we put ourselves, each other forward for jobs. Of course we, we shout each other's names in meetings, but that, you know, I don't think anybody was encouraging me to. What do you think you learned about yourself in that experience? Well, I think the I- interesting that my initial reaction was shame, um, without doubt. Yeah, mortified. Uh, so that, it speaks volumes but crucially I did make a change I did then go on after the pay rise in the tech job and I did then leave but off my car saying to you I think what was really difficult is that I was trying to advocate for women as a collective I was trying to change that three percent rule but then I realized if you want to be the one who navigates change the, the, the people that are being sacrificed are my family and myself. And that was a really weird thing that I was, yeah, I was gunning for something, but uh, to the detriment of me. How has that experience helped you? I, I'm going to call you an entrepreneur. <laughs> How has that helped you as an entrepreneur to press into uncharted territory and to do new things? It was yeah, it was absolutely a fire in the belly. There's nothing like a woman scorned <laughs> than to give you the absolute drive. So yeah, it, it, I'm, I have no doubt it accelerated my move into social media and and that that successful second chapter of my career because for the first time I was in control of of my own pay and that's a completely different process. And within that, you've, I've had to navigate my rate card and and what that looks like but it's definitely given me a better sense of my worth and then interestingly that we should do this podcast today I've now gone back into advertising six years later and of course it always works out this way my side hustle my my scorn driven venture is what has been my like trump card for going back in and and um yeah, and getting a role that fits my life. And, and now that is less about money and more about flexibility. But How do you feel the industry has moved on in that six years with respect to the way women are treated? I think the advent of flexible working is, is unbelievably 
different for women. I, I, yeah, it is really interesting to me to come in six years later when when I left, it was nine till whatever time at night, late, in the office, five days a week or nothing at all. And now I'm in the job where I'm going into the office once a week and I'm able to yeah do the school run. So for women, that is brilliant. But as I'm speaking, I'm wondering the downside of those office relationships is you don't have, I don't have as many personal communications. So therefore you might not get to the point of being um, confident enough to say to a peer, how much are you getting paid or what have you negotiated for this? So I do worry that when you're in your silos at home, that could be challenging. But there's definitely been shifts, I think, or maybe there's been shifts just in myself. So I'm better able to advocate for myself. One of the current topics floating around social media is whether organisations should be forced to publicise pay brackets and remuneration for prospective roles. Is there a move to greater transparency in the industry? I I very much doubt there is. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I think because it would be really exposing. It's a very, very top-heavy industry. No, I, I remember in a few agencies I've worked at where the pay grades have accidentally got out, you know, when things have been left on photocopiers. And it and it turns absolutely everything upside down, doesn't it? But it, it's wild because it would it would prove a lot of yeah, a lot of these issues. What changes do you still want to see for the women that you've advocated for in the past and obviously yourself as a leader in the industry? Do you know what? I actually would shift this out of a work context and move it to women to be more comfortable talking about money. I actually see it in such a down, right in a basic sense. If a guy owes another guy 30 quid, he'll be like, mate, you owe me 30 quid, give me the 30 quid. And girls would be like, I'm really sorry, whenever you can, would you mind? Uh, I don't want to be a pain, but could you give me that money? <laughs> and and this this is what we're really, really terrible at. And I, I don't know what my female friends' salaries are. I don't. And and it even makes me a bit uncomfortable talking about that, where we talk about periods and menopause and our our sex life, but we, we it is an area that we'd be more uncomfortable talking about. And then if we can't do it with the people we trust most, we've got very little chance of being able to show up and ask for the money that we're worth in corporate setting. Are you feeling stuck? Has conflict got you down? Have you considered mediation? Mediation is a confidential and flexible way to resolve conflicts. 86% of all mediations end in a solution, saving time, money, and stress for all involved. Thanet Mediation Center, a Broadstairs consulting initiative, offers mediation services to individuals and organizations in Thanet, Kent, and further afield. For more information or advice, email us at info at broadstairsconsulting.com. We are here to help you move forwards. One of the things I admire about your process of moving into tech was the way that in that situation, you knew that you needed to advocate for yourself and you did that very effectively. What advice would you give to someone who needs to advocate for themselves but doesn't know how to in that situation. Do you know what? For me, there was a very simple piece of language that was, like, again, my my calling card. I just said in my negotiations, I need to be paid what I'm worth, and and that is absolutely truthful and doesn't and doesn't leave any wiggle room. And and it, what was mad to me during those negotiations, it was probably a two minute conversation that was felt so uncomfortable for me but that the implications of that in terms of moving up a pay grade in terms of the money coming into your bank account in terms of the mortgage you can access is so huge so it's just like sometimes you just have to really even if I'm closing my eyes as I'm talking about this it was excruciating and I think don't forget that lots of people find it excruciating but sometimes you have to just have to force yourself to make that make that thing but yeah I need to be paid what I'm worth is very powerful I like that but I recognize that your immediate reaction 
when you found out that you were being underpaid was shame. There is a journey between that feeling and getting what you're worth. Can you tell us a little bit about how you made that journey? Yes. Um, Yeah, there is a really big... And actually, when I... To be really transparent, when I say I need to be paid what I'm worth, the insecure part of me is saying, yeah, dream on. But what I what I really tried to apply at that point was some facts, some fact searching. These are what these are the things I'm doing in my role. This adds up to this. You know, these are the clients I'm billing. This is what peers in the industry are being paid. Whether I want to beat myself up about and 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 go down that self worth spiral, the facts state otherwise, and I think that is really useful. In fact, for me, in any mental health challenge, I always try and dig around for the facts because then your brain goes, "Oh, okay, well, yeah," because your mind does lie to you, and particularly with self worth, I think. As you look back over your career, is there anything that you wish that you'd done differently? I wish that I prioritise my babies. I really do. I think that with each of them, another three months out of my career wouldn't have made any difference. It really wouldn't. But you, your babies are only that small once. And I think it, is, it comes from a place of fear of thinking you're going to drop out of off the, off the career ladder, that you're not going to be thought of as well, that people are going to judge you. But yeah, there are bits of your life that you, you can't get back. And... I wish that I hadn't tried to have it all and just been more comfortable with letting my career just sit a bit more fallow for a couple of years because I'm I'm the other side of that now. My eldest is now 10, my youngest is five, and I can back I'm back to being able to give my career much more of my mind, but there's a very small window. And for the women who have made that choice to spend more time with their kids, to deprioritize their career for a while. How easy do you think it is becoming for them to re-enter the workforce? So again, this is timely because I've gone back after six years and there's a, it's not a gap in my CV, it's a different thing, but I, but I haven't been in industry. And on a near daily basis, I have to n- remind myself of, of my value in that I've got a lot more work life experience than a lot of people when you've raised kids when you've had another decade of living you you bring stuff to the table that might not easily sit on a cv but there is some accrued wisdom that you just can't get in any other way so i think it's it's really important to 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 yeah know that they are assets and and I, I, you have to coach yourself through it. I really do. I have to just have a, have a word with myself. And for me, I've always been really driven by role modelling for my children. So if I'm if I'm feeling insecure myself, then I'll, I'll channel it for them. You do have wonderful kids, <laughs> and I'm sure that they appreciate that hugely. Last question: You mentioned that you were out at dinner when you found out that you were being underpaid. If you had to live your longest day again, what food would you choose to fuel it? I mean, versions of this question honestly preoccupy my mind so often. (laughs) It's it's an aside, but yesterday for lunch, I had a cheese and pickle sandwich, an apple and a pint of orange squash. I didn't have any Walker's crisps, but I was laughing to myself. I had a really big presentation to do. And I think it's no surprise that um, I'd like resorted to this like very lunchboxy safe place. But my, um, yeah, my longest day, my, yeah, my meal of choice would always be ridiculously bougie, but it would be sushi and then it would be steak and chips and green salad. And then probably um, like brownies and ice cream. I'd, I'd feel quite queasy after, but I'd, but it would help. Or maybe, maybe as per yesterday, my longest day meal would be a version of a lunchbox meal. <laughs> well, look, all colours, all shapes, all sizes. I'm here for that. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you for the women that I'm sure this episode is going to inspire. And thank you for your vulnerability and sharing your experiences. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you for asking me. You've been listening to a Broadstairs Consulting Limited podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Tune in soon to hear the next installment of The Longest Day. Copyright 2023. Production copyright 
Broadstairs Consulting Limited. All rights reserved. <laughs>